What's up guys? We're out here at the Intercoastal Waterway in a spot that I've not fished before. So down this way, which I'll show you in a second, is the bridge leading from Freeport to Surfside over the Intercoastal Waterway. Which, by the way, is the body of water that completely encircles, or I guess it doesn't completely encircle it because the ocean is on one side, but semi-circles uh, the island of Surf Surfside, effectively making it an island. Now, my theory is it's really, really warm today. The wind has suddenly decided to change directions, so instead of going out, it's coming back in. And I see a lot of birds on the water, so I think those are all good signs. The water's nice and green. Uh, I would love to catch a shark or a ray today. That, that's the goal. That doesn't mean that's what we're going to walk away with. So what we're doing is I've got a couple of rods out. Let me show you how I've positioned our stuff today in an effort to catch a shark or a stingray or both. Now it is another one of these ridiculously windy days, so most of the camera time will be positioned behind something. As I walk, you're just going to have to suffer through it. So here's our, our first rod, and I've got it jammed into a rock down here, and then just kind of positioned up against another one here. Now this is the one I've got loaded up specifically for a shark. I've got 50 pound mainline on, which is, you know, about the threshold for decent, decent sharks. And I've got it cast out. Got it cast out. Let me get you guys out of the wind as I explain this. I've got it cast out, not into the middle because I couldn't get it that far, but maybe a third of the way out. It's pretty deep with a whole head of maybe a one pound mullet on. If you look on our last episode where we went to Bolivar, the mullet that guy gave me, I'm using that. And I've got the head, which is about this big, on a, a fairly strong, small, for sharks. Circle hook. So I think it's a size 8 Gamakatsu octopus hook. Or technically I don't think it's an octopus hook because the, the eye isn't bent back. But it's four times as strong as usual. I've got that cast out there. I've got it wrapped in electrical tape to kind of mask the electrical output. Sharks can sense electrical outputs. Uh, it's one of the ways they hunt. They use organs on the front of their face. Sensory perceptors called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And they can actually detect the electrical output of living creatures. That also means they can detect metal. And also, you know, you take a piece of metal, like here's a pair of scissors, bite down on it. It's not something you want to eat. Wrap it in electrical tape, it becomes a little bit more palatable. So try that experiment. I do believe sharks are very sensitive eaters. I mean, think about it. Most shark bites happen. Why? Because the sharks are test biting something to decide if they want to eat it. It's a mistaken identity, and the shark figures that out by biting it. Now, if a shark bites on a piece of metal as a test, my theory is he's going to figure out really quick it's not something he wants to eat. But if it's a little bit softer because of that tape wrapped around it, it might convince that shark to take that bait just long enough for you to set the hook. So that's sitting out there for a big shark to come along. By big, I mean anything up to 100 pounds. I think anything more than that, because of the gear we're using and the terrain we're in, I would lose the fish. I would need bigger gear to stop it. So I've got that going over here. Let me show you what I've got set up on this side. Great place for rattlesnakes, by the way. I've actually got that sit all the way down in there. Apparently it retained a lot of water, so when I put it in, the uh, overflow came out and landed nicely on my shirt. And I've got 65 pound braided line, uh, main line going out over here. Now I have a theory, so bear with me. On that rod, I've got 100 pound monofilament tied to a 300 pound swivel, a gripper, actually it's not a gripper lead, no. I've got a uh, teardrop lead but I still have the 65 pound braided main line tied to a 100 pound uh, monofilament line as my leader down to a fairly large circle hook. Um, maybe a size six, size six Nautilus hook. Now I'm using the monofilament because I'm fishing for another animal in that area that also can detect metal and that is a stingray. Now, the turn right behind me, you got real close. Now stingrays, land almost on a bait before they take it. It's almost like a UFO has come down to abduct the food source. So its whole body is going to kind of maneuver over my leader. And stingrays, sometimes they kind of have to work a bait into their mouth. Generally speaking, a stingray has more time while taking a bait to figure out whether or not the leader is metal or whether or not there's a leader at all. And you don't want a fish to know there's a leader or a hook attached to a bait. So I've got monofilament instead of wire because stingrays can still sense the metal, but I don't have to use wire, mast, and tape because they don't have sharp teeth. 
the reason I have cast my bait in that spot is because if you look over here, if you look over here, you will see this shallow inlet right here. And it's so shallow right there, I can actually see the bottom. I can see it through the water. I would say maybe four feet deep. So this, I mean, this is made for ships to move back and forth through. I don't know how deep it is, but I'm assuming it's at least 20 feet deep or deeper. This over here gets as shallow as four feet. Inlets like this one, and like this one over here, are the type of place that stingray have a massive hunting advantage over other fish, including other sharks. Because they can enter shallow water that other big predators cannot enter. So fish taking refuge from predators will travel into inlets like this. The sharks might have to turn back. They're not comfortable getting in that shallow water. Even things like large red drum or jacks, they're like, ah, too shallow, I don't like it, I'm gonna go back. The stingray has no problem. A 100 pound stingray can hide perfectly well in 12 inches of water. So my theory is by casting out over here, might be more likely to hook up on a ray. Does that mean we're gonna get one? No, of course not. It's fishing, not catching. However, that's the theory. All right, now while you guys sit there, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cast out just a little BB shot. I was using this to try to catch some carp the other day, even though it's my bass rod. I was kind of um, experimenting. So I've got a little bit of shrimp on. I'm gonna to try to see what live fish we can catch because if I can, I'd like to switch that rod from dead frozen bait to live bait. So if you look right over here, pick you guys up for a minute. See that structure behind me? That's what I'm gonna cast over to. There you go. Can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. I'm gonna cast over to that right there and see if that's the kind of spot that I think maybe a whiting or a croaker or a pinfish or a perch might be hiding. Let's see if we can't pull something out of there. You gotta be careful, you gotta be super careful walking around these slippery rocks because slipping and getting wet is not fun. But a lot of the times in salt water, this is the type of place that oysters really like to congregate in. And uh, you slip on a bed of oysters, you will be going to the hospital for stitches. It is like slipping on a, a bed of razor blades. Cast this out. Got to take the wind into account. Always take the wind into account. Otherwise, I can already feel I'm snagging on a rock. Okay, got a dash. So this is the type of thing, you can, you can estimate what the bottom of a, a water feature is like, and sometimes you might get pretty close to getting it right, but ultimately the best way to tell is to get a line in the water. And these rock shelves apparently extend all the way out to that structure, which is a good 20 feet off the, the shoreline here. And I think it's safe to assume it is probably going to be similar all the way down each side here which is not only important to try to catch bait, so I don't snag my line, but it's also gonna be important to know that retrieving a bigger fish, because now I know the type of snags it might try to bury its head into to cut my line. So let's cast out again. I'm gonna cast, let's see here, a little bit further, just straight out. I'm gonna let the wind kind of drift my line down. There we go probably crossed over my other line here. Just gotta be careful. That is, by the way, one of the most depressing things you can do to yourself, is cast the line over something that you've already got set out. Uh, and you start reeling and you don't know it, but you snag that line and you think, oh, I've got a fish on. And then you hear the other reel going off. And you're like, oh my gosh, I got another big fish on the other one. It turns out you've got nothing. You just hooked your own line. All right, so here's what's going on down there. Got a ooh, lovely croaker, good size too for the species. He took, I, I didn't know it was a croaker, I actually thought it was a small red drum. They look alike and he was fighting really hard, but man, look at that, isn't that a lovely fish? I love those stripes, you can hear why he gets his name. Maybe, if he decides to do it again. Most members of this family of fish, not all, but quite a few of them have crushing teeth in their throat that helps them specialize on feeding on crustaceans. And when they rub those together, it makes that croaking or drumming sound, which is how several of the members of the family, red drum, black drum, the croaker, get their name. There you go. 
So this is a good sign. The fact that he took really quickly is a good sign. You know, when you're having to fish and fish and fish and fish and fish for bait, you know, you got to think that the predators that you're trying to catch are doing the same thing. And if they're in an area where they're not catching any food, you know, they will move to a new area, which is a, a luxury that, you know, as a fisherman without a boat, I am not privy to, to the extent that it's sometimes necessary to catch big fish. However, Today we don't have to worry about that because lovely, lovely bait fish are about. I also saw a crab down there, which, make no mistake, I will use a crab for bait. Um, long time ago, maybe, let me think how long ago this was. I would say at least 15 years ago, pushing 20, I was with uh, my dad, my brother, and a group of uh, people that he knew from work and, and sports functions. And uh, we were out fishing for red drum at night. It was my first foray into surf fishing. And uh, I was very young. And my dad caught a 100 pound stingray with a barb about this long. And I still have that barb today. I'll show it to you. But uh, yes, and we caught that. I was like, what was the moral of that story? I totally forgot why I went off on that rabbit trail. It's because we caught the stingray on a blue crab. And stingrays will take crabs. And the crab we caught him on was about this big. So you can imagine how big that stingray's mouth was. So we will use blue crabs for bait, no questions. But for now, this is bait. Ah, uh, well, remember how I told you guys not to slip on an oyster, oyster shell? I did, I slipped on the concrete. I fell, not only did I break my glasses, but I cut my arm really bad. So, put this aside. Ah. Uh. This is why I always keep some of this gauze, this vet wrap with me. Let me show you. I'm not just gonna unwrap it for the sake of the camera. I actually need to rewrap it really quick. Get this ready, cause it's bad. I think I'm probably gonna end up having to get stitches, which is great. Get this ready. Yeah. Yep. You can see that, whoa, don't lose my other and only other good bandage. You can see the blood already coming through it. This is a, a nasty little cut there. Yeah, what do you think, guys? Hospital? Stitches? Probably. God, it's not the, not the worst cut I've ever had, and I'm, I'm doing a good job of stopping the bleeding by wrapping it up. I wrapped it up instantly. God. So out of the way get yourself some of this vet wrap always 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 keep some form of first aid materials with you oh lord yeah that's that's good and tight it's, it's tight enough so that it's uncomfortable which when you have a bad cut is how you need to initially wrap it and then after it's been taken care of, you can wrap it to the point where it's comfortable. Oh, so my brother's coming over here to help me out. I gotta get all this gear back to the car. Let me show you what I slipped on. So I was coming to check this rod out and look here. You can see the surface of this covered in this mud. I just slipped right on it. And uh, luckily I was able to grab a hold of this ledge up here. And uh, I smacked my face on the side, broke my glasses, but I think my arm landed along the edge of this right here. And that's where the cut came from. I'm gonna just have a look at it. If I, do, if I don't have to get stitches, I really don't wanna get stitches. Uh, the worst part about it is I'm still convinced that was a really good spot for stingrays. Things cut short. That happens, it's been a long time since I've been really hurt doing something. And I'm not saying that this is a life-threatening or, you know, fishing career-ending injury. This is just a bad cut. But it is that. It is a bad cut. So, there's the cut. It's not super wide, but it's really deep. And my whole body weight landed on that concrete. So, it kind of feels like I, I blocked a baseball bat. So, it hurts really bad. So, what we're going to do is just kind of open it up a little bit, clean it out. And what is this? I'm not a fan of this. Hydrogen peroxide, which apparently a doctor told me 
I think when I, the last time I cut myself rope out of my knee, said that hydrogen peroxide doesn't actually kill germs. What it does is it bubbles and it removes uh, very small, almost microscopic particles out of your cut, is what he said. Anyway, get this open. It's hot, it's too hot. Oh, lovely. There you go. Now you can kind of see it. Not the worst cut I've ever had. Not a, not a small cut though. This is gonna hurt. That really hurts. Oh yeah. So anytime you cut yourself, and it really doesn't matter where, you can see the fat deposits under the skin. That's the mark of a a decent cut. And there is a bit of dirt in there, so let's get the hydrogen peroxide out. There we go. See how it bubbles like that? The way it bubbles out. The whole point is you're trying to clean the cut of particles of dirt and things like that. There we go. You can see all that dirt in there. That's we got to get that out. That's infection city right there. Yeah. Let's try to make sure we get all the dirt out of here. Oh, see now, it's now it's starting to bleed. That's a good thing though. Whenever you get it cut initially, if it's a you know dirty surface that you cut it on, you do want it to bleed a little bit. That's especially true when you have like a deep puncture. Assuming it's not life threatening, of course. If you get punctured in the chest, don't let it bleed. But you know, if you stab yourself with a screwdriver or something like that, something random that makes a deep puncture, you let it bleed for a little bit. And in this instance, although this is not technically a puncture, you do want it to do the same thing. But also that flow of blood coming out of my arm will also take some of the dirt out. Now I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get advice from two people, uh, a former supervisor who does who actually trained me in first aid under the Red Cross, and then a friend of mine who went on to become a certified EMT. I'm gonna have to ask like retrospectively what was what was the 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 good and the bad pros and cons of everything that happened in terms of how I'm taking care of this. I don't have any butterfly bandages, so I'm gonna cheat here and use what I've learned over the years. You don't have butterfly bandages, which generally I find don't stick very well. I just use a long band-aid, pull it closed, and then even though this wasn't made for this function, it still works and you can wrap around the edges and it does just as well. All right, I think we are going to avoid hospitals and avoid stitches. So the cut is just on the threshold. And yes, I put regular band-aids in the place of butterfly bandages, which by the way, regular band-aids, especially if you get the wide ones that are made for like your knees and elbows, stick way better than butterfly bandages. Because at the end of the day, it's all about surface area and butterfly bandages are like super tiny. It just doesn't fit with the natural laws of physics in terms of sticking. Anyway, so we're gonna wrap this up in this. This is just a few rolls of the, the vet wrap. <laughs> My my jujitsu is going to have to be on the back burner. I'll be throwing a lot of kicks in the gym. There we go. When you don't have a pair of scissors, use your teeth. There. And this stuff, wonderful stuff. I highly recommend you get some. It's called vet wrap. At least that's what I always refer to it as. Uh, it was invented, I believe, for uh, veterinary care for horses, and it works wonders for people. So this is just the way things go sometimes. You know, always advocate safe practices, but you can't, you can't predict everything. You can't be ready for everything all the time. Sometimes things just happen. 
and as careful of as careful as I was trying to be, you know, I still ended up slipping. And uh, it could have been a lot worse. I think grabbing a hold of the uh, the higher rock ledge saved me from a much worse injury. I think that would have been a deeper cut if I had landed on it full force. You know, uh, my sunglasses are fixable, I think, so there's a silver lining. And who knows, those might have saved my face from getting a, a nice pounding on the rock because I did smack the glasses while I was wearing them on a big piece of concrete. So at the end of the day, things could have been a whole lot worse. This cut is not, not too bad. I will definitely survive, and it's not the worst cut I've ever gotten. I've gotten much, much worse injuries than that. You know, I've been bitten by snakes and alligators and you know, cut my hands down to the bone and all kinds of... I've got a, my mom says I'm the most expensive child in the family, so that's hospital bills. So yeah, be safe out there. Carry a first aid kit. I will, you know what? I'll probably make a video on how I stock my first aid kit following this one. The, the, the type of stuff I like to take with me when I go out places, when I go fishing. Um, having that vet wrap with me really saved me from you know, bleeding a lot. Like I said, that's not the worst cut ever. I definitely wasn't in any type of real life-threatening danger. I don't want to make it seem like this is the worst thing that's ever happened to a human being. But uh, it was a decent cut, and having that first aid material on hand made the situation much easier to deal with uh, and safer for me. So yeah, that'll be a video that's coming. So keep a first aid kit with you. Use the best and safest practices. While you're having fun, always be safe. So I am going to go change clothes out of the, the wet and muddy clothes that I fell into the water with. And I'll think about all those fish I missed out on. Those stingrays, those sharks, they're out there. I'm coming for you guys. And until I do, I'll see you guys later.